Welcome back, Pet Parent. I'm so excited that you are here, and I'm so excited for our guest this week. I probably could not do her justice in introducing her, so I'm going to let her do that. But really quickly, if you happen to be tuning in for the very first time, I want to say welcome. My name is Jessica. I'm a canine nutritionist, a holistic pet health coach, a positive reinforcement dog trainer, and your host for the Pet Parenting Reset, which is the podcast that you are listening to right now. And we talk about all things uh, holistic health and nutrition for your dogs and cats, because when we know better, we can do better. So today, there are a couple of different topics that I want to discuss with our guest, one of which I have recently started incorporating into my practice with my clients and has been such a huge game changer, but we'll get to that a little later on. I want to welcome Dr. Ava Frick to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Ava. I really appreciate this opportunity, Jessica. You've got an awesome program going and what you've done with the education that you've gotten and how you're putting this out there for all the pet parents to learn from. I think it's just phenomenal. And as you said, you're a one-woman show, so that's pretty amazing. You get some extra gold stars for that. (laughs) Thank you so much. I tried to hire somebody one time and it didn't go very well, so... My fault, my, I always, I know that is the, um, that's the thing, right? Like if, if employees aren't doing well or produce or their productivity isn't going well, it's because there's a problem with the management. So I know it was my fault, but it just didn't work out. So I am definitely a one woman show and I appreciate your kind words so much. Um, because that is the whole point of this is to educate people and to open their eyes. And even if, they don't walk away with something that they are immediately putting into action. I know that it has like left a little mark somewhere in their brain that is one day going to pop Um, back up and be like, I heard about that somewhere. And you know, the universe is bringing this back around to me. So would you mind um, just introducing yourself a little bit and telling people, I always like to hear like origin stories. Why did you want to become a veterinarian? How did you get into this? Okay. Well, actually, uh, ever since I was three, that's just what it was going to be. Back then, I didn't know the word veterinarian, but I knew there were people doctors. And I guess my thing was I was always going to be an animal doctor. And I grew up on a farm. So I think, you know, that added to the enrichment of being able to integrate with a lot of different species of animals and, and see how them how they live their lives or how they react to certain scenarios. I really learned about animal behavior by watching them all the years, especially cats. I spent so many, so many days up in the loft waiting for those little baby kittens to come out and everything they do. So so that was my start on a farm and the family had a supermarket and a slaughterhouse so and a garden. So we had lots of good nutrition and I was always, we had gardens. So that was a big part of my life was eating better and I enjoyed being outside. I'm a doer. You know, like on a rainy day to have to sit inside or read a book, you know, that as a kid growing up, that was like punishment. I'd rather be outside doing something. I'd go find, I'd even clean the basement or the garage as opposed to reading a book. But later on, I had to learn that if I was going to get anywhere, I had to read some of those books. <laughs> anyway, you know, and I was, was there and, um, geez, when I was a, I was like 15, the first veterinarian came to our town. And so I started working there and, you know, one thing led to another. Karina was just 12 miles from where I grew up, so I worked there for a while on their research farm back in the old days when it was a lot different. Yeah, but it was always my always my path, always my passion, always where I was supposed to be, and I didn't let anything get in the way, not even boyfriends. So <laughs> I love that, not even boyfriends. I think I'm going to have to quote that on social media, not even boyfriends. Um, <laughs> so... Now, I'm interested to know because so there are a handful of veterinarians that I've talked to and interviewed on the podcast who just always knew that like nature had the answers. And so even a couple of them have said like it was really difficult for them to get through veterinary school because it kind of went against everything they already knew and believed. Have you always had that like I am assuming growing up on a farm, did you always have that holistic mindset or did no. veterinary school make you like think differently? How did that no. go? No, it just trained me how to think in the traditional mode. No, it really wasn't until I was almost 40 
when I had my aha moment. So I guess the first really was a few years before that I was playing on a women's soccer team and got body blasted from the side and fell down then and I couldn't stand when I got up I couldn't stand up straight the next morning I still couldn't stand up straight so I thought I got to go to the doctor well I didn't the doctor in town happened to be a DO but I didn't really I had never been to a chiropractor before so I walk in all hunched over and as a DO they learn Dr. Vastiap they learn how to do adjustments like chiropractors would so that's what he did with me that day he adjusted me and I walked out standing up just like God <laughs> Jesus you know I walked in all crippled and I walked out upright. So that was like, oh, there's something about this. So I started doing the chiropractic for myself and then learning that most chiropractors do some nutrition, you know. So I got little bits that kept coming to me. And then in 1997, by then I was about 40 years old. I'd had a son. I had my baby. And so that really was my turning point when as a mother, I'm looking at, okay, some of this doesn't make sense and there's got to be a better better angle at it. And then one day this little dachshund, as they do, those little short-legged, long-bodied, poor back dog came in and he was on my exam table. I'm still doing traditional practice. And that particular day I looked at him and I go, hmm, I can give you some drugs, but I can't fix your problem. And that's when I realized if I was really living up to my oath and going to be the veterinarian that I thought I was supposed to be and could be, I needed to go do something better, something more. And so that's when I got certified in chiropractic in 1997. And that was the beginning of my whole transition. It just took off from there. Yeah. So I was always looking for something else I could do to treat pain. I started going to human physical therapy conferences, trying to find out what do they have for pain for people that I could apply to animals. This was in the, you know, 1997, 98, 99, that era. Uh, we had Remedil was on the market, and of course still Pred and Phenobutazone, but there weren't a lot of anti-inflammatories out there for animals. Um, at that same point in time, I got interested in laser and worked with a laser company and actually designed the first laser spinal pads. There were some things out there for horses, but no spinal pads for horses or dogs. So I designed the first of those that was ever on the market. So started with laser, and that's when laser wasn't cool. I was being chastised for Yes, promoting this thing that had no research, which there already was a lot of research out there. But, you know, if somebody doesn't look, they don't, they just think it doesn't exist until they look. And some people will stand on their pedestal saying it isn't and it can't be, and they haven't even looked. So, you know, we had to get the whole industry had to get beyond that. And then at that same point in time, I was one of the original pioneers that began the whole animal, well, specifically dogs especially but the whole animal rehab scenario realizing that there's exercises that can be done for the animals there's a whole lot that is available to put their bodies back together if if somebody has sur has surgery and they do rehab as a human from a fractured leg or arm or whatever those same things should apply to the animals as well so i was in the forefront of beginning that whole profession which Boy, by the mid 2000s, it was really building in momentum. And by 2015 or so, it was like the fastest growing specialty within the veterinary field. So it's it's uh, grown by leaps and bounds. Yeah, that's pretty cool being on the front lines of bringing in all this change into the veterinary industry. That's that's awesome, especially when. It doesn't involve a pharmaceutical. That's right. Yeah, there's so many ways out there. Yeah, and through all of that, I got into using herbs, looking at herbs as solutions, and I really got interested in Western herbs. So not the Chinese type, but more like uh, in India. So we're looking at Ayurveda and those types of herbs that they use in their uh, professional medical care for people. And yeah, I did a 180 hour herbal course. I got certified in that. And so that then helped me move away from needing drugs for anti inflammatory or drugs for liver or whatever it is. There was so many options out there. And the animals really, especially if you keep them simple, the, the, what I find is that because I do the kinesiology, the muscle testing and the bioresonance testing. So I know like what I've prescribed is the right thing for that animal and the dosage. 
But what I found is in checking herbs and testing them is that they prefer the ones that are similar. The ones that get too many different products, too many different Mm -hmm. items all combined, like all in one kind of a product. A lot of times it doesn't test as good as a simple one or two things. Because if you get exactly spot on, that's the thing you need, which is kind of like homeopathy. You know, the one thing that changes that whole scenario of what's going on. So, yeah, I really, from there, got more interested in the Ayurveda, and that's been a lot of fun, too. So that is something that I have not had an opportunity to have anyone on prior to you to speak about is Ayurveda. And I don't really know that much about it. It seems similar to Chinese medicine to me, but different enough, obviously, that it's two different um, uh, modalities, two different, like you're learning very different things, I would imagine. Um, And so I've had quite a few people on talking about traditional Chinese medicine. um, But Ayurveda, tell me, can you tell me maybe a little bit of what the differences are first? Yeah, I can give you like a little brief synopsis. So, I mean, you're right about both of those cultures in the East compared to where we are here in America in the West. Uh, They have existed for 5,000 plus years and their philosophies about wellness and health care have extended for all that length of time. And part of their success is the fact that they don't get caught up in one area like just the heart, just the liver, just the kidney. You know, and that's all that that is focused on. They look at uh, the life. So where you live, what is your mindset? How do you look at stress and problems? Uh, what is your diet? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's more of a, like a functional medicine type of a practice. They look at uh, certain constituents of the body that um, are innate to that individual and then utilizing channel so so certainly with the traditional chinese you have acupuncture and that that whole aspect of the needles and finding those meridians and those pathways and so that's that's going to be the big key point that's different there with ayurveda it it it's part of its philosophy is that at conception you are sort of bequeathed um, a certain percentage of what they call doshas so there's the tri dosha there's vada pitta and pa and depending on what percentage of each of those you are granted, that you are at conception, start out with, then that makes a difference on how your personality is going to be, what your body features would look like, um, how you handle food, uh, what your organ function could be, all of those things, your, your mindset, just everything about you is based on that being in balance. And when the dosha, whatever percentage of each of those you are, and animals are the same way, when that gets out of balance for what is your normal, so it's not a third, a third, a third for everybody. There's different ratios, which is what makes you have different body features. And we can talk about it with animals too, certain traits that are typical. Um, like if you look at a Bernese mountain dog versus a greyhound or a whippet, you know, their, their, their body shape is different. They're still canines. Where they came from is different. What their jobs are different. How they focus on life is different. How their bodies process food is different. The type of muscle cells they have is different. And it's all about which of those doshas is more, more dominant in that individual. But it's also then those staying in balance and then when they're out of balance is when some type of a disease process comes in and the other thing too is that none of this is is like cut in stone the same every single day the body shifts as the moon changes during the month there's changes that occur in the body there's changes that happen out there with the viruses and the parasites and all the other creatures and when they cycle and how that might affect your body but also seasonally there's different foods that become more compatible and more digestible for those different dosha traits. And so you want to maximize those during those seasons. And like typically in the wintertime, you look at rooted vegetables, because just like deciduous trees, everything goes down to the roots and you're more hibernating in the winter. And so you look at eating more of those kinds. But 
uh, a kapha type person is going to be one that enjoys their food a lot, may tend to overeat, um, but uh, they also can tend to retain fluids. So you're not going to eat the things if you're having if you're out of balance. You got to watch and not eat the things that's going to add to more fluid in the body. And so with each of those, then are certain diseases, it could be more common with whatever dosha you're strong in. So it sounds like, again, we're, we're looking very strongly at foods and herbs, probably, <laughs> different things that we're finding from nature to keep us in balance. And yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and just uh, the other part, I mean, that's part of it, too. But the other part is helping you to, like, look at life from a perspective that keeps your inner self calm, relaxed, you know, not the wagged out, stressed. And you know, the, the different types can kind of tend to ramp one up. But there's ways to, like, help balance that. And you, there's learning that can be done. You know, there's so many behavior programs for the dogs, and it's about, the, the the pet parent learning how to find it in that individual or focus on it or how then the person has to get trained to train the dogs. The dog can look at life from a different perspective and then take something more calmly and not get stressed. And so so that's the same way. And and that a bit about the doshas, I mean that's just a snippet of what the whole Ayurveda philosophy is about. But it's a good starting point because it happens at conception. And so it kind of sounds like there's a very spiritual component to it as well. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Very spiritual component. Right. Because we are spirits, you know, we're, we're spirits toting these bodies around your genetic entity, like what your family history is, whether you're Irish or British or from India or Asian or Germanic or Scandinavian, whatever it is, you know, that's a genetic entity that we have at this point in time. But we're still spiritual beings as the everybody is that and that's the life force that's the innate life force so the prana in in ayurveda and that's yeah that's who we really are the rest of it is just what we told around gotcha so one of the things that i obviously think there's a lot of merit to but also haven't ever really like delved into super deeply is like different breeds of dogs and cats and feeding different breeds differently. That is something that I'm, I haven't really dug into very much. I understand that the, there certainly could be, you know, differences in different breeds. I, I try to look at every animal as, as more of an individual, especially yeah. when they are, they have symptoms they're in some sort of disease state but mm -hmm. um it's it i can see the correlation that you're making between like what ethnicity we are where like the just the um culture that we grew up in and how different that is and i'm wondering in my mind now i'm trying i'm like actually trying to correlate that to different dog breeds am i way off base there yeah. well, actually there's a section on my website under the nutrition tab that says feed for the breed. There's feeding for the breed, feeding for the season, feeding for the dosha, and you can click on those and read through it. So yeah, this is very key. The breeds that have lived for thousands of years, wherever they came from originally before America got here, which is relatively a short period of time when you look at the thousands and thousands everywhere else. Of course, there were people here, but not of the not at the level of what we're talking about when we're looking at like our origins. So not to not to negate Native Americans or whoever has lived here and their cultures too. So so it so whatever dogs they had would be the very same, whatever they ate. So these these bloodlines that have lived for thousands of years based on the foods that were common in the country where they lived. So if you look like in Egypt a lot of the dogs, their body types from there is designed because of the climate to help them survive. And then also the, their type, like more like Vata types, um, help them with what food was available there. So dates and nuts and bugs and their, their diet was different than, say, one who would have been in Scandinavia where it's very, very cold. 
So then you have different shaped body dogs and what they would have lived on for thousands of years, more fish, more oils like that. Not to say that Egypt, they have a big coast too, but what you're looking at polar climates. So the things that keep those animals warmer, more fat, you know, the fat is a good insulator. Well, you don't want that where it's so. So again, the, their computers then, their computer is programmed to know those food ingredients and how to best utilize it to maximize survival for that body. So now we take those breeds and you bring them to where there's a totally different type of food and expect that breed to all of a sudden just transition into this different style of feeding. And, you know, like you don't even want to want to get into the topic of the processed foods because, you know, that's the corn and the chicken. So now every breed, you know, at one point in time, so if we go back to the, you know, started in the 50s, but say 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, you started seeing the raw diet and people being becoming more aware and conscious. But before that, many people didn't think about no problem with the kibble, the the corn, the soy, the chicken, the chicken parts, the meal. I mean, that's what every breed ate. It didn't matter if you were a beagle or a Newfoundland or a poodle. It was all the same. Well, their their computers did not all handle that very well. Yeah. And so now you have alterations in their GE, plus you have diseases because of that. Mm. It's so fascinating. I actually was on your website earlier and I was looking at the um, quiz that you have oh, for uh-huh. for um, what is your dog's Ayurveda dosha type. Mm-hmm. So I took that and um, for my dog specifically, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure how well I answered these questions. I don't know why. I found some of these questions kind of difficult and they were they were like very simple questions, but I'm like, I don't know, but this, but sometimes this and sometimes that. Yeah. And not <laughs> everybody does everything. Yeah. Um, so it says that my, so my dog's name is Kimberly. Mm-hmm. Um, it says her pitta is 50. Uh-huh. Uh, is it Kaffa? Kaffa, uh-huh. Is 33. Okay. And Vada is 20. Okay. Is what it gave me. Okay. And so the math uh, might be off there. They're just a tad in the computer system. But, yeah. um, okay, so what breed is she? So she, I she's a mix. Um, I did her embark a number of years ago, uh-huh. and it was primarily Chihuahua and Poodle with, like, a whole bunch of other stuff in there. Okay. So Chihuahuas she, or Pittas? Okay. A poodle can be a vada. There okay. Might be something else. The kaffas are the more rounded type dogs, like a beagle's a kaffa, um, Pyrenees, St. Bernard's, the more rounded. Bulldogs yeah. would be kaffas, though that's the kaffa body type. Now, the uh-huh. kaffa personality is one that's very loving, forgiving, uh, the best nurturing parents, the one that mm-hmm. wants to keep peace, wants everybody to get along tries really hard to make every day be a good day that's kind yeah. of their personality type versus that the is. Florida is the chihuahua like in your face pittas are really smart dogs smart just in general pitta is a smart type they learn really fast they don't ever forget um, they're very focused very on target they got to have a job they're doing something all the time type a they can get angry easy mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah 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 so my dog is very um she wants everybody to get along all the time mm-hmm. she likes calm and quiet yeah. she likes mm-hmm. to sleep and she uh gets freaked out easily like she if yeah. if anything is off yeah anything at all she's like yeah. no 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 no, no. <laughs> that's the vada part so vadas um uh, are fun loving they they're like they like fun. They like entertainment. They like play. They like games. Uh, they're not the most out there in communication. They would avoid confrontation if, it, mm-hmm. if at all possible. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, they don't like upset. They don't like the yeah. confront. They don't like anger. They don't like things. Now, not that, you know, the coffers are about solving it and making it go away. The vadas are, oh, I can make that go away. I'm out of here. That's, oh, 
parasites makes a problem go away. It's like, yeah, and, and the, the fortunate thing for the bottle is, is they are the long distance runners. A bottle mm-hmm. body is lean, slender, um, not carrying excess weight. The dog types are deep chested, the thoroughbred that would be a Vada type, the greyhounds, the the Vislas, the, those are Vada types. Dobermans are kind of a Vada type. Um, yeah, the deep chest, usually thinner in the loin. That's the mm-hmm. Vada. So, so, so that's where her points came in for that. Vadas tend to have digestive problems. The pittas can eat anything. Nothing's a problem. They're the ones that can eat the trash and the junk and bring home that deer that's been dead for weeks and never have diarrhea. Yeah, Vadas aren't so lucky about that. No, yeah. No, that's how I think yeah, my dog has, she is very sensitive in her digestion and mm-hmm. very picky um, of, of what she will eat. And she's also very, um, she runs hot, for sure. Oh, well, for Chitta. Now, it, yeah. in saying these things, while each of those percentages, you know, reflect that that could be part of that individual, also, if the Pitta is out of balance, then you would have GI problems. Mm-hmm. Pitta has a lot of fire, and so fire is what's needed for the fuel, it's the Agni, for that digestion. And so if that was out of balance for a pitta, then you would have GI problems. But if you have too much vada to begin with, you're going to tend to kind of have a little bit of that sensitive system anyway. Gotcha. Yeah, I can see. I can definitely see how like anything out of whack, anything out of balance, it definitely messes with her digestion. Um, And sometimes she won't even eat. She's just like, no, this is too, like today has been too stressful. I am not eating. This is yeah. not happening. <laughs> and it's okay too. I mean, let her yeah. let her have a rest. But it would be fun to find out is is this how she, she truly is, or are these out of balances that need to be handled, and then that would go away. Yeah, I definitely think I I have I've been trying to work on getting her back into balance, but not with Ayurveda because I'm not very familiar with it. Mm-hmm. But with like Chinese medicine and with more sciencey stuff like the, the animal biome and all of that like she needs more fiber she needs more vegetation but she does not want to eat it she is a yeah. meat so i can tell you that uh a lot of so the dogs don't do good anyway with a lot of vegetables because the high cellulose and their mm-hmm. intestinal tract is much shorter than humans so mm-hmm. so usually that has to be somewhat a little bit cooked like a lot of raw doesn't work anyway and especially no. for the vada type so yeah more cooking is is are likely cooking blanching you know that kind of thing not too mm-hmm. much raw 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 uh otherwise yeah it's harder for them to digest mm-hmm. yeah yeah oh yeah for sure but any any vegetable or fruit she is like no thank you mm-hmm. she wants to eat animal <laughs> oh yeah. that's her thing that's the bitter part yeah she wants yeah, to eat animal and kind of digest that really really well they're gonna mm-hmm. the more meat the bit better for them yeah, yeah. And that is where, that's where she lives. She's like, nope, don't give me anything else, please. Just give me the animals and I will eat that. Uh Um, But so, yeah, it is absolutely fascinating to me because obviously I know like with Chinese medicine, I always say like you could spend your lifetime learning it and you're Mm -hmm. not going to learn it all. And I feel like Ayurveda is very similar. Like you're Mm -hmm. just forever a student of it. (laughs) Yep, for sure. Yeah, which it's fun mentally, like to keep yeah. learning, and then there's so much to it. You learn part, and then you're ready for the next to come in, and then you incorporate that into your thinkingness and doingness. Absolutely. So the other thing that I wanted to kind of pick your brain about, and this is something that I actually um, I learned from Dr. Katie Woodley, and I've started mm-hmm. using it with my clients, is um, hair tissue mineral analysis testing and that is something that I think you're you're also a little bit passionate about so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit tell me what it is um and how you how you utilize it what do you think it's good for yeah you could say I'm a little bit passionate about it and that might be an understatement (laughs) oh yeah it's you know I, I look at when you have all these different pet summits and you see the doctors that come in everybody because I've been like the host and so you have different ones like I would set up 
the the seminars or set up the conversations with the different doctors and they all have a focal point of something that has grasped them whether it's turmeric or whether it's um the biome or whether it's you know there's something that that they really focus on that really brings their attention to life and for me it did become the hair tissue mineral analysis part of it's because i'm always looking for the real why i look at what's not successful why is this not successful and then what really started it and a lot of times by the by the point that you get an animal that you're going to evaluate there's been so much going on in their life is however many years it is but to get to the really beginning of where the problem started is difficult and that's what this opened up for me it's being able to find the why it's being able to go who begat who begat who begat who begat way like, in the bible you know you get to the beginning of the source of what now appears to be some kind of a disease entity but really it started from some imbalance in the body created by an imbalance of minerals and with those of course every mineral is associated with certain vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids you've got the whole food complex so targeting the minerals and then everything that's connected to that mineral which is in science it's all very science oriented and also if you think about before there were drugs the way everything in livestock and the world was looked at was what's out of balance we take the veterinary industry, 1800s, early 1900s, and before that, it's like, what vitamin or mineral is in excess? What are those, that animal that it's walking funny or its head's tilted or it's having seizures? What is in the food or the ground or the water that is too much or not enough? That's, that's, how, that's how lives were saved mm. and pathology was recognized. And then it just fell off the radar with the onset of drugs and it's like okay the quick fix thing but it doesn't get you to the why all you do is put out fire after fire after fire and for me i wanted to find the arsonist so when i latched on to the understanding and got trained in how to interpret a well done hair sample it was answer to everything it became my my crystal ball because it tells you where this individual has been and it also will predict when you know how to read them where this individual would be down the road if things don't change yeah, yeah. It's, it's huge so just the ava that, that i am it's like i can't just learn something i got to really learn something so the next thing then i got to share it with others so arlene tolan who was my instructor that helped me learn how to interpret um we collaborated and pulled together a lot of cases and actually in 2017 had our research published in uh, one of the prime veterinary journals with AHVMA uh, was peer-reviewed article so that was the first of that to be out there by a veterinarian in a veterinary journal like that since then if you google up there's lots and lots of more articles that have come around uh, one of my earlier students um, she is in Europe and now is a PhD in all of her veterinarian and a PhD, and it was all done on fur mineral testing and uh, seizures and how those can be affected by looking at this. Is there patterns and trends and that kind of thing? So my goal then now is to try to educate as many veterinarians as I can on this so that we're not just guessing at what supplement an individual needs, whether it's a dog, cat, horse, or rabbit. What do they need? that we know exactly what's going to change what's happening and why. And then you have this test that you can do as a follow-up to help match your blood work, to verify that the toxic metals are there, not there, going away, have gotten worse, that the changes in the minerals, it's, just, it's a really fun game. And if anybody enjoys uh, being a detective and then solving a crime, it's a whole lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. So, yes, it is, I think. Um, it's just a hair sample that you can take at home because there are tests that you can, that a pet parent can do at home um, well, with a hair the sample. The at-home test, uh, checkpup.com, 
So this was like three or four years ago. A couple entrepreneurs who had used it on themselves was interested in building it for the dog community. And so they're online looking and looking. Of course, I come up multiple times in this area because I'm doing it intensively. I've got the research. I actually wrote the books on teaching doctors and animal nutritionists how to interpret the hair tissue mineral analysis tests for dogs, horses, and cats. And, you know, it's similar for all species, but the numbers can be different. But at any rate, so they found me. And so we've created this checkbook.com, which is my brain in a computer that when the sample comes in, all the data that's presented is, is what I would interpret. And the supplement recommendations are based on my years and years of expertise in this field and what I would, would say to my clients that they need to do. And it is, um, it's looking at, you'll probably need to correct me, um, the heavy metals, the mineral imbalances, and I feel like there was something else that it also looks at. It also, well, it gives us the metabolism rate of that individual. Okay. So it's also called oxidation or metabolism. It's the same thing. And that is, this is what we use food for. Food is to give us energy. So when that individual eats, how quickly do they turn that food to energy? So it could be fast, it could be slow, or you could have one that's what we call mixed, which means they got one foot on the gas pedal and the other foot on the brake. And that metabolism or oxidation rate is based on the functionality of the adrenals and thyroid, its whole endocrine system, hypothalamus, pituitary, all of it. How fast? are slow are those specifically adrenal and thyroid working and that gives us the metabolism rate and so we look at ratios of certain minerals to tell us how fast or slow the adrenals are working and how fast or slow the thyroid's working and that gives us the metabolism interesting and, and that helps us to know how to feed them yeah and i also am I'm so interested in so many different things but um, how we need to feed differently, how we need to approach supplementation differently for animals that are spayed or neutered, is that I would imagine that affects metabolism quite a bit as well, yeah, or no? And allergies. So one of the jobs of, that, of the gonads is to keep the cytokines down, and the cytokines are pro-inflammatory mediators in the body. They, they, if they're not under control, then you're going to have more inflammation. And we live in an inflamed society now. The bodies are very much that way. And especially with the early spay-neuter programs, those individuals, those little bodies don't even know they have testicles or ovaries. It, they're never matured to the point enough that, they, that the body ever benefits from it. So that's why we have so many allergies and autoimmune and all these itises out there. All those problems is really stemming from that. And then the lack of feedback of the hormones that would be happening that are, are pr would be produced if you had the gonads that then are helping to direct and guide the adrenals and the thyroid and the hypothalamus and the pituitary and all the, the body systems into working more optimally, not only towards their daily needs, but also as their army and military, their protection services. So this gets out of balance and we have a lot of diseases because of those early spay neuters, a lot of allergies because of that, not being able to keep inflammation down. And certain cancer is inflammatory, obesity is inflammatory. So all those are at a rise. You ask, why are they high? You know, why does this happen? Well, that's part of it too, in addition to chemicals and other things that are out there. But recently on this, this I got thinking, so I've the whole microbiome, that has been building up for maybe six years or something like that. And it's had a lot of research and studies. And I've never, by the time it came around, I was out of traditional practice and I was just doing the rehab. So I was all about, you know, the exercise and the body mechanics and movement and posture and all of that and nutrition along with it. But I never got into doing the transplants or anything like that. But I appreciate the doctors that do. And, and so... I'm looking at this and I'm seeing cases come through that I'm doing TMAs on and ones that have had the microbiome and some that were successful, some that aren't successful. And I got thinking, hmm, and I'm seeing some things coming up. And I thought, well, okay, you're spending a lot of money to put 
these perfect microbes that should be in the gut in the gut. But what if, what if the nutrient plane in that body only supports the ones that are currently living there? And I'm not talking about just changing their diet. I'm talking about the fact that certain minerals can be high or low. And that affects what, what type of microbiome can exist because some need more of something or they need more of this in order to make a certain cycle go. And so you spend a lot of money putting this perfect microbiome on doing the transplants and then it fails. Maybe it failed because my thought was it's like in the old days there used to be a lot of quail that lived in Nebraska in that area and people would go out there to hunt because there were so many quail. And then the quail started dying off. Well, they died off because their food source is no longer there. What they would feed on and their protection is not there anymore. So they don't live there in the volumes like they used to back in the 60s when my dad used to do at bird dogs. It's totally different. And I'm thinking that's kind of like the microbiome. is like we can't expect this perfect colony to be there if we haven't already corrected the environment. Otherwise... So I uh, talked to Dr. Odette Suter because she's so big into the microbiome, and I was doing a consult with her on a case one day, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going ha- to ask you to consult me on this topic. And I asked her nowadays, when you're doing these transplants, how many of them are like good to go with just one? And she thought for just like a little bit, she goes, zero. None of them on just their first one anymore. She said, it's different than it used to be. Used to, they would maybe get some. That did. And then she come and we talked for a while back and forth, you know, and she's explaining it all to me. Okay, I'm getting it, you know, from one of the experts. And then she said that, um, oh, I got a mental block now. The doctor that started, that's done the most of research, uh, Margot. Roman. Mm-hmm. Most of the research in this field that uh, she has also recognized that in the dogs who have low cortisol levels, they have more of a problem in stabilizing the microbiome and getting the new ones to take off. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because I can tell you on a TMA test, the ones that have low cortisol production based on the ratios of the minerals and what the adrenals are doing, I pick them out all the time. So you could feasibly save the money on the microbiome to like first get their TMA test done get that environment changed and then the body's going to be going hey we need some different buggers here then when you do the transplant a better success rate in the transplant that's where that's my most recent uh makes yeah. sense to me it does make sense and it's actually um interestingly i didn't i don't know all the science behind it but i have counseled many people on not like people come to me and they're like well i've heard about this fmt and i'd like to try it and i'm like we're not there yet like Mm -hmm. i don't please don't waste your money on this we're not there yet like your dog's gut is so bad right now (laughs) let's not get there don't ask me how i know to tell you this but we're not there yet and so it makes so much sense to me like the terrain isn't going to allow for it yeah no no you could put them there but they're gonna the rattlesnakes will get them yeah it's too arid, too wet, too soggy, the alligators, whatever. Yeah, it's not their place or their time. Exactly. Well, that's yeah. good that you had that inner knowingness that you knew that it just wasn't right. And, you know, it's just such a hot topic right now. And everybody thinks it's the do-all, end-all. And they hear about yeah. it when all these well-known doctors are talking about it. And they're thinking, that's it. That's where I got to go. But, again, yeah. it's all in the right time. And that's the same thing with the rehab. Uh, people enjoy water sports. And so the underwater treadmill is a big draw for rehab. And there were people who was like their dog had been injured or it was old, uh, old dogs, and they want to get them and they want to get them strong and they want to put them in the water. I go, no, you can't, you can't start that now. It's not the time. You put that, that body in there. That there's other things we have to do first to condition them. And then the other thing that I've seen sometimes with the, with the underwater treadmill is that the facility, the people there, don't really understand all of the mechanics deep enough. And their goal is get them in and get them going and get them going fast. You know, they think fast is better. Well, it's not. 
you have to learn to walk before you learn to trot or before you learn to run. And maybe I learned some of this in training horses and riding horses and growing up in a, in a horse family and being out with them. But you, you never go to the trot until you've got the walk right. Because the walk is the precision of each leg and every step. A trot is different and a run is different. And so you can cheat at a trot or a run, a low, mm -hmm. a gallop, a canter, whatever, in the, in the water and on land. Like I'll, I'll say people that have a dog, you know, that's coming through rehab, we, we, they've got to do a certain amount of walking, but is it safe to trot? Yeah. Trot's easy for them because they're only using certain legs a percentage of the time, but they're not going to get strong and really rehab if you don't walk first. And so in my treadmill, a lot of times the dogs never ever got to run because they would get the walk so perfect in the water that then they could walk, trot, and run on land. But you, But to skip that, that time that's invested in that, it's not the benefit of the animal. Mm -hmm. It makes so much sense. And I, I try to equate a lot of what I learned for myself into what I do for animals. Mm -hmm. And all I was thinking about when you were talking about that was like, I can do a lot of push-ups, but they're not good form. I have to, I, if I'm doing a really good form push-up, I can only do so many of them. That's but right. But that's more important than yes. doing a lot of them. Exactly. Otherwise, and, you're cheating certain muscles. You're overusing other groups. You're not okay. ever going to get good and strong if you don't take it at the right. Yeah, that was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, okay. It, I know you do, you do telemedicine, correct? Oh, Telehealth yeah. consults mm -hmm. for... Mm -hmm. Um, dogs, cat. Do you do other animals, horses? Uh -huh. Like yeah, mostly do? I see dogs, horses, and cats. That's what you get the most stuff. But yeah. I do rabbits. I raised rabbits for quite a while. I had English lops, and I raised and showed rabbits all over the Midwest. And yeah, I was really busy with that for a while. And so wow. rabbits are yeah, I'm good at rabbits too. So enjoy oh them. And I've done birds and lots of other things. But but with the hair analysis, it's mostly it's the dogs, the cats, and the horses. But I can do anybody and, and figure out using bioresonance and frequencies and waveforms. You know, every, every species lives within a certain range, like mammals as a grouping even. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the birds, the avians, are going to be within another range. And so, so even or, every organ operates at an optimal frequency range and an optimal waveform. So we look at are they, is that organ or that individual operating within optimal ranges? Or are they out of range? If they're out of range, or is that organ overworking or underworking? And so there's mm -hmm. a lot of different scanning and testing I can do with that. And there are actually systems out there that people can use. Um, Zyto was the first one that I ever used. And I had to do a lot of transferring of the human information to the animal. Quest four, no U and a Q E S T four. Any practitioner that does that, they are very human but also animal. They have spent a lot of time investing in the animal industry to help better their equipment and their answers and the work. There's a lot of learning that goes into it. And then mm -hmm. most recently I've been using the Oberon system. It's the easiest to operate, easiest for any individual to utilize on themselves. It's not it doesn't have all of the data on product information in there. You have to individualize it or enter in yourself. But I'm working with the company to try to expand on that so we can get it a little more Americanized and have a lot of the really good common products in there so make it more available to other practitioners to utilize it and get the answers. And what we're wanting is, what does this individual need? It's the customizing. What mm -hmm. does that individual need at this point in time? What dose? Not what is the newest item on the market, the one that's had the most talk at the recent conference? What do you do for everybody else? Well, that may work on nine, but this one it doesn't work on at all. And sometimes to be wrong is not only that person's money that's spent, but sometimes your window of opportunity can be so small that you don't have time to make a mistake and say, well, let's see how they do come back in two months. May not may not have had that much time yeah that's very true um so 
off topic question, but I just am so curious because everybody is so different in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. Since you spent so much time and raised um, rabbits, mm -hmm. do you have problems feeding your dogs and cats rabbits? Oh, no, I can feed them okay rabbit. I don't eat rabbit myself. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to look at the look at it, the leg on the plate or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But once it's chopped up in the raw food, because I know that's what, I mean, that's a lot of what cats eat. And I certainly enjoy cats enough that I want them to be able to live their best. And it's part of the nature's chain. I mean, the rabbits are provided. Now, of course, I was into the fancy domestic rabbits, so it's a little bit different. But you know, people eat them too. I never ate any of mine. Okay. I'm just curious. On the show. Uh, yeah. Uh, if a rabbit shows, there are people that had the English lops and they would slaughter them and eat them too. And, you know, that's, gotcha. that's okay. But yeah, no, once I know them, I can't do that. But to, to, to buy rabbit freeze dried for the cat or raw for the dog or whatever it is, rough, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. I, I, it's yeah. always fascinating to me. I, um, yeah. my pet sitter used to have a rabbit. And I didn't think about it at all. And I like gifted some like rabbit feet or something to her dogs. And she was like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Mine's yeah. in the back. Right. Right. Um, so, how, well, before I ask you that, um, do you have any one thing that you like to tell pet parents? Like, any one piece of advice to give a pet parent who you have no idea. Oh, I have no idea who's listening, like what level they're at. They could be feeding kibble. They could be feeding raw. They could be, you know, on a health journey with their pet. They could not be. But do you have any like one piece of advice that you like to give just everybody to to think about? I think my piece of advice is that don't allow yourself, you're the parent, don't allow yourself to get convinced that you're wrong by a doctor or a clinic because that's their concept of what's right or wrong. If you have something that you believe is not right about your animal and they don't see it, that's just that they didn't see it that day. But that doesn't mean that you're not observant of what's happening. So being observant and then being able to stand your ground and then finding the veterinarian, you have to have a lot of holistic practitioners don't do everything. Like I don't do the IVs. I don't do the spays and neuters anymore. So there's, um, I don't, I don't do blood works. So you have to have a traditional practice too, but th there are traditional practitioners who can work with a holistic practitioner and not be degrading to you, the pet parent, or the other doctor. And sometimes it takes a little while. And I've had clients that, that you know, like they'll email me somebody new, and they, I saw you on this podcast, blah, 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 and I'm interested in this, and the doctor, this and that. And, and it's like, you need to fire them. Find somebody else. You know, like they insisted I had to have vaccinations. They wouldn't see my animal without this, or they made me feel bad because or they wouldn't, whatever it is, then maybe they just had a bad day, or maybe that's how they are. Some people can be pretty forceful in their mind that they're right. I mean, people want to be right, whether they're wrong, they want the wrong to be right, or they want the right to be right. But they'll work hard to prove somebody else is not right to prove that they are right. And when you have that inner feeling that something isn't right you've got to go with it and not allow yourself to be deluded and realize that there are many different clinics and different practices out there that there could be just the right person it may not be quite as close they may not be in your hometown maybe they're in the next town over but for you to feel good about what you're doing and for your because your animal is going to be like you you're going to create in them the same kinds of things that you have and that you like and so for you to be belittled by somebody because that doctor's philosophy like oh you should feed this kibble you should feed this brand of company i don't want to hear about it raw is bad and all of that feel 
that they've been ingrained with, they haven't looked far enough. And so I think that's my thing because everybody's journey, everybody's ruby slippers can be a little bit different, but it's always going to take them to the right place because it's the thing that you had all along. You just didn't realize that it was there. And, and sometimes we can lose sight of who we really are too. And so being able to stand up for yourself and, and not be deluded and finding those websites, like if you're having problems with the vaccine thing, I send everybody to Dr. Will Fowler. He was a classmate of mine in vet school. It's vitalanimal.com. He's got a lot of programs there where he's about educating on the whole problem with vaccines. And I've got, I've got a case right now I'm going to send to him and share with him because it was so typical. And this dog was like nine months old when it began with after a vaccine and all the problems that he went through. And you can it can be mapped. I mean, like, that's what happened. But, yeah. That I think that's my that's my thing that you know, everybody hears about. Don't do kibble's not the best for you. There's yeah. all, this is I think that's my my thing. I would say. I love it. We talk so much about on on the podcast. I talk so much about building a team, that's and it. the fact that you as the pet parent are the head of that team, and um. To, you know, to stand your ground, to be confident in your decisions, and you know it's best for your pet. And so I love that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where can people find you? Um, your website for if they want to consult for telehealth, or if they just want to follow you on social media. What 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 do you have going on? Where can people find you? Yeah. So lifeextendmethod.com. I had my branding. I hired somebody to help explain what everything I did did all these different things you know like how do I put it into a few words so that's what he came up with is because that's my goal is extending their lives and making sure that while we're doing that they're enjoying their life that they're having fun that their candle when it does burn out is like just a short time and by then they're already 17 18 19 years old and their family knows they've done everything for them so lifeextendmethod.com uh, my email is there. You can read on the website about me, where I came from, and yeah, what I do. And then I really, with the telehealth, I can help anybody through any problem, whether it's allergies or GI or liver or kidney or cancer or whatever it is, urinary. I can help with any of those things and, and sort out where's the originating problem and what products are going to work best. And work on that diet, the nutrition, all of that to help pull them through it. And sometimes, you know, sometimes a drug is the thing that they need. So be it. It might be, but it won't be forever. It may just be for a short time. I, I never, never, ever think that, that you would have to have your animal on prednisone for their entire life because they had an autoimmune reaction. I can tell you that can be changed yeah. or because they had pancreatitis or whatever that you can't do something. It's just that right. the other doctors haven't found all the options put right. into their hopper to give you more answers well um for those of you listening make sure to go to the petparentingreset.com and you will find all of dr ava frick's information and links um on the website in the show notes and uh i just want to say thank you again for being here i appreciate your time i appreciate you educating people and being a um a resource for uh, people because holistic integrative functional all of that like it's it's not easy to come by so being available is uh, for pet parents is wonderful and i want to say thank you and thank you for being here thank you very much i appreciate the opportunity and i love the fact that i can be an advocate for all of them and and to be able to be a part of your show. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And guys, have a great rest of your week. Please give your pets some extra love from me and Dr. Ava this week, and I will talk to you next week.